Hi, I'm Laura. I'm Josh Mound. And we're here to have an engagements conversation. So uh, I'm going to start us off and I'm going to talk about an ethical question that I have and I'd be really interested to get your feedback. So I've been thinking as the election comes closer about the ways that people talk about those who choose not to vote or those people who choose to vote for a candidate other than one of the candidates for the two major parties. Um, and so first, the choice not to vote is often cast as ethically problematic. So if somebody says, I don't like the system at all and I abstain entirely, we see those people as somehow um, ethically bankrupt or morally flawed that they've made this decision that somehow hurts all of us. And I wonder if that's actually true. On the other hand, when someone decides to vote for a third party candidate, so they still participate in the civic process, if things don't go the way that someone wants or they don't like the outcome, a lot of times that choice is cast as ethically flawed. You've made the wrong choice. You should have just voted for one of the two major party candidates. But I have questions about whether or not, first, we should really blame those people. But second, isn't democracy supposed to be about voting our conscience? And what, is, what are the ethical gambits of not voting your conscience? I think that's a great question and an important question to ask ourselves as democratic citizens. And what I'm hearing and what I'd like to hear from you is ethically, what do you think is the calculation that we should make in evaluating that or that might we consider when deciding if it's an ethical choice to abstain or an ethical choice to vote for third party? I think we would probably want to measure the cost. So what are the costs of choosing not to vote? So what are the costs to you? Are you sort of psychologically troubled if you want to, uh, if you vote for someone who you don't really like? Um, or vote if you'd rather not at all. Um, but also, what are the costs socially? So do some people bear more of the costs if people opt out of the civic process or not? So I think that's a great question at the root of any good empirical study is an ethical question because we have to study something that we care about and we have to think about something systematically in philosophical terms in order to operationalize something in a way that we can measure it and study it, particularly when it's a social phenomena that we can't go into the lab and isolate very easily. And so what I hear you're saying in terms of something like cost or something like discomfort, I think you could think about devising a measure that might have many different variables in terms of maybe the monetary costs mm -hmm. of the economic policies of a particular politician winning, winning or losing to the person abstaining or voting third party. We might try to bring in things in terms of certain rights that may be given or taken away, depending on that person's identity. And we could also have some type of attitudinal measure, for example, of a feeling thermometer, which is often used in surveys of how strongly do people feel about a given politician or a given issue. And while it could obviously get messy, as a lot of empirical social research does, there are certainly ways, I think, that we could get at a lot of these ethical issues through empirical measures and maybe start to devise something that would get at a, an idea such as what is the sacrifice or what is the cost of abstaining to, uh, for one citizen versus another citizen based on both how they feel and objectively where they are in the social structure of the country. Yeah, that's really helpful. That's given me a new way of thinking about this. I hadn't considered the monetary cost, but certainly you could look at the various factors that lead to one candidate winning or losing and then see who did and did not vote for them and what were the economic policies coming out with them. Mm -hmm. And so is there an economic cost to certain people choosing not to vote? And is, again, is that is that risk distributed equally? Mm -hmm. Thank you. That is a really helpful way for me to think about this. So Josh, what have you been thinking about? I've been thinking a lot about the technological progress and the medical progress we've been making in terms of treatments for new diseases and illnesses. And on the one hand, I think it is really a story of a triumph of you know empirical progress of the march forward of science that there are things today that we have that wouldn't have been imaginable 40, 50, certainly yeah. 100 years ago um, before antibiotics were invented, let alone some of the nanotechnology, different types of you know new frontier medications. And so often when you read about this, it is presented, I think, in some ways justifiably so as this is science moving forward and making us, you know, a better society at 
little to no downside costs. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great point, and I am a you know a big fan of medical technologies that improve our lives. But I wonder sometimes when you know when we're making those decisions, what are some of the ethical decisions that are at the heart of those empirical studies or those medical studies? So, for instance, when doctors choose to research one kind of cancer to devote a lot of resources, perhaps towards a cancer that they're really close to curing, it obviously seems good to me that they're going to cure it. But what if there's a far more pervasive or deadly cancer that we're much further away? Away from curing, but eventually curing it would have a far greater net impact. Is that where those dollars should go? Um, and just in general, what about those diseases that are far harder to treat? Like, is that, and so on the one hand, I think maybe we should put our resources into that to things that are less glamorous, that are sort of more drudgery and that are going to take longer to solve. But on the other hand, I think, you know, people who maybe are, have diseases that we're much closer to being able to treat effectively for those people, it really matters that a treatment might be around the corner. Um, and so it seems to me that there's this real ethical question at the heart of some of those empirical studies. What do you decide to work on? Um, and what kind of decisions do you need to make ethically about the value of um, the different kinds of treatments that you're coming up with and who it will affect? We know there's been a lot of pressure right now about how expensive some pharmaceuticals are um, and how hard it can be to get basic treatments in certain developing countries. Countries. And it seems like these two questions are really close to each other, the financing of pharmaceuticals and the net good that they could do. It seems like, you know, ethical questions better than I do, but it seems like what you're saying in some sense, this is an issue of diffuse costs sometimes mm -hmm. or very concentrated suffering. And it's almost a classic utilitarian debate and yeah. that you might have some people who could be a marginalized group either because of, you know, certain identities that are more likely to get a certain disease and therefore are less likely to get attention or just that some illnesses are inherently rare but cause a great deal of suffering to the people that have right. them where there are maybe minor annoyances that affect lots of people. And I wonder how would you think through adjudicating, you know, something that is a minor annoyance to lots and lots of people versus major suffering to a few people. That's right. You know, it makes me think some about some of the things that people like Alexis de Tocqueville said in Democracy in America when they were talking about the democratic process, um, where Tocqueville was really concerned about the tyranny of the majority. So we believe in the United States, a majority rule, it does have this kind of um, relationship to utilitarianism. The net good is the positive thing to do. That's the ethical choice. Um, but I wonder when we think about this tyranny of the majority, just because the most people want something doesn't mean um, that it's necessarily a good thing. Lots of people can actually want something that we might say is really ethically troubling. And so when we think about things in these terms, um, I wonder, I worry about what might be being left out. I think that brings up a good uh, measure of desire or measure of suffering and that we always tend to turn to money, particularly in a commodified healthcare system. Mm -hmm. And the ability to value your life is therefore very unequally distributed and someone could you know monetarily value a minor suffering at much more than someone else could value their entire life not due to any sort of emotional or affective value they attach to that but simply because through other means they have the ability monetarily to demonstrate to people in the marketplace that they care about that. That's right. And we're supposed to believe that there are some things that are not for sale or can't be bought and sold. As the song says, can't buy love. So there are supposed to be some things that aren't for sale, although we know, of course, that you can purchase all sorts of things that can make it far easier for you um, to find love, even though it's not supposed to be something that's for sale, nor are children, for that matter, supposed to be for sale. And I think something that this brings up is that there's an opportunity cost to any particularly, you know, great advancement, could those resources, could that brain power, could the financial capital, could the scientific capital have been dedicated to something else that would have ultimately made the world an even better place by alleviating more suffering, however we decide to measure that, than the decision that was made that in the moment could have seemed perfectly ethical and almost unobjectionable, like how could it be bad to try to cure this one illness but it's always a question of what was the alternative that could have been done. That's right. Or when we think about the history of pesticides, at a moment where you're worried about crop yield, it did not immediately seem ethically problematic to kill any pest that might be damaging your crops. Obviously, in a moment of climate change, we might think about those decisions quite differently. So good to remember, of course, that all ethical questions are um, considered in context and you don't always have all of the information at your disposal when you make that decision. 
and that even seemingly unobjectionable empirical progress has a lot of ethical concerns that might be baked into it that are hidden from us upon first view. Yeah, cool. Well, I think this has been an excellent engagements conversation. Thank you. Bye.